Hello, and welcome back to Break the Twitch, a podcast on minimizing distractions and doing more of what matters through minimalism, habits, and creativity. I am your host, Anthony Ungaro. In this episode, I am thrilled to be joined by Brooke McCallery, who is currently finishing up the U.S. portion of her book tour for her new book titled Slow, Simple Living for a Frantic World. It's an awesome book, and I'm excited to share this conversation with you. It's an absolute treat to have Brooke here in Minneapolis to come into the studio and do an interview because she is typically living in Australia quite a ways away. In this episode, we discuss a wide range of topics from finding a more reasonable way to define work-life balance to working with your partner and even finding productivity in rest. This episode is going to help you find new ways to incorporate slow into your day-to-day -day life, and you're going to love it. I'm excited to share this conversation with Brooke. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the Break the Twitch member community. The member community is made up of viewers and listeners just like you who want to support the work that's going on here at Break the Twitch, keep it sponsor free, and receive really great benefits every single month. There are audio courses available to members with new ones coming out every single month, a private Slack channel, community, and more. There's a ton that you get for supporting the work we're doing here and keeping this podcast and the other videos going. So if you do have a moment, please check out breakthetwitch.com slash community to find out more. But for now, let's start the show. How's it doing? Good. How's good. it doing? I don't even know what I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's doing good. It's doing good. That's good. Um, so you are here, which is kind of a wonderful, amazing thing mm. here in Minneapolis because when we met, that was you were not in Minneapolis. No, no, I was definitely about as far away from Minneapolis as you can get. Yeah, um, um, Australia. Yeah, it was two years ago, mm -hmm. which is amazing to me. Yes, how quickly it's gone. It is. So I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining me and. Uh, I know that you are just wrapping up the U.S. portion of your book tour. Yes. How has that been going? <laughs> it's been amazing. It it has genuinely been amazing. It's also been one of the most challenging and intense experiences of my life. So uh, we started, and I say we, I've been touring with my family, my two kids who are seven and nine, and my husband uh, since the end of June, mm -hmm. and it's now the middle of September. So it's been three virtually three months of touring, uh, pretty much nonstop. And it's been wonderful. I think I've done 40 something events. So 40 something opportunities to meet podcast listeners and book readers and people who have no idea who I am or what I'm about. But that has been the stuff that has been really incredible, really wonderful to have conversations with people about this whole idea of slowing down uh, and seeing lots of the country too, way more than I expected. Yeah, definitely. And you've done that all by car we have we had one internal flight um and that's been it we've driven the whole time we just rented a little uh like a suv and stayed in airbnbs where we could and hotels where we we're only in somewhere for a night and it's been um that that's been less stressful than i thought hmm. it's been nice to be able to take it slow and um listen to a lot of audiobooks harry potter audiobooks in the car and yeah see see parts of the country that we would never have otherwise had reason to see, which has been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're up to 30 something states. Now wow. You might through. be, you might be competing with me here <laughs> and I've lived here my whole life. I'm trying to think probably been to about 30, right. 35, somewhere in that yeah. range. I think you still, you've just nudged me. There, Maybe <laughs> I haven't counted recently. Oh, that's, that's great. It sounds like, uh, I can understand how that might be taxing, but right. rewarding. Exactly. That's exactly what it's been. It's been both tiring and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of good things are, I guess. Well, I guess we should back up a bit for, for those that might not be familiar. What was it that generally kind of inspired you to take on the, the slow your home movement? What, right. what got that ball rolling for you? Uh, I was not slow at all. I was the opposite of slow. I wasn't mindful. I wasn't intentional. I was living very fast, um, hectic kind of life. 
my um, my overarching desire in life, let's go back seven years ago, was to appear successful, hmm. <laughs> you know, and I did a lot in order to make that happen. Uh, I mean, on the face of it, I think it looked like we had succeeded because we had been, uh, we'd moved to this lovely house in the Blue Mountains out of Sydney that we were renovating and uh, we had a baby and we had another baby on the way and I was running a business from the garage in our backyard and my husband had this really well-paying job in the city and all of these things that were what I thought success should look like. Mm. And I was unhappy, desperately unhappy. So I kept trying to add more to life, thinking that the next thing that I add, the next thing that I manage to achieve will be the thing that would make me happy. And it never did. So that was where I was. That's where I landed, actually, when our second baby was born. And then uh, not long after was diagnosed with postnatal depression, Mm. unsurprisingly, looking back. Um, And it was a very severe postnatal depression. And I spent a lot of time with my psychiatrist like a lot of a lot of a lot of time and it was her who put me in touch with this idea of slowing down i would complain to her about how busy i was and then um you know how as a result i wouldn't get to enjoy anything and she asked me one day well have you ever considered doing less i was like no (laughs) is that an option and uh i was offended initially that she thought that i was incapable but then i went home and i googled it how do I simplify my life? And that's how I found Leo Babauta's blog. So that was that was the initial entry point into this idea of simplifying and slowing down. The point you made about being offended. Right. I can I understand that because in a way that request can seem like you're being challenged like oh you can't keep up, huh? Exactly. And that's how I felt. That's honestly what I thought she was saying. She was like you're deficient. In some capacity, you cannot cope. So you're going to have to go over here and do less. Sorry. And then I equated doing less and slowing down with being boring or being mediocre or not being successful. And that I, that was the first time I realized that society and me as part of society had like busyness was the goal. Constantly doing, constantly acquiring and consuming was the goal. Uh, and yeah, the, the, like I think the opposite has been proven to be true for me that slowing down and simplifying is not boring. It's not mediocre. It's where I've actually been able to live fully and enjoy fully. Over that time, I'm curious how your perspective of success shifted right. throughout the years of exploring this stuff and, and embracing a different path. Yeah, it's been really interesting actually to see that. And I think it's still evolving what I think success looks like. But Joel Zaslowski said to me once, being successful to him was having time for the people that he loved. Mm. And I think that's a really brilliant way of defining success. It's very little to do with financial gains. You know, I think there's a level of comfort. But beyond that, I don't think that there's going to be a huge amount of gains in in, ha- in happiness or contentment the more money you make. But the more time you get to spend with people you love, the more positive impact you have on your community, the more connection you have, I think the more successful, I guess, you would feel. So for me, it's shifted completely Mm. away from, I just wanted people to think we were successful. I didn't actually know what success meant to me. I just did the things that I thought I should be doing in order to look successful. Mm. You know, like when I was running my business, I was head first in that whole super mom entrepreneurial space where it was I wanted to be one of those people that they would write magazine articles about you know she built this empire while nursing two children and managing to do yoga every day and blah 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 it's exhausting and it's not real either but that's what I thought I wanted I wanted to look like the successful person Mm -hmm. and had never thought to think what success actually meant for me that's a fascinating distinction right defining success for ourselves but defining success for ourselves for other people yes. looks like and that's something i haven't really thought a lot about in terms of that differentiation yeah yeah and it's been interesting for me as well to see it um shift for my husband because he was nowhere near where i was um he like, his work was in corporate up until three years ago and he um had identified or it built an identity around his career which mm. is not uncommon i don't think <laughs> no, uh, not you know and that the ladder that he thought he should be climbing and when i started slowing down and simplifying and re kind of renegotiating what enough looked like 
he he was on board at home, but it was so far removed from his life at work, it felt like he was kind of being pulled in two different directions. And it's been really interesting for me to see him re reevaluate what success looks like as he's become self-employed and um, started to have the ability to choose what success is um, and, and kind of remove that from his career, I mm -hmm. guess. So it's been, again, it's ongoing, but it's, it's, it's really interesting. And once you're tapped into noticing that stuff and being patient and watching it evolve, it's really interesting to then look back and say, well, three years ago, we thought that this was an impossibility and yet here we are. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's definitely an evolution that Amy and I have seen as well around right. working together, around um, just continually exploring what success means. And our definitions have changed and continue to change around, wait a minute, it would be really nice. We don't have kids yet, but it, it's really nice to not have to wake up to an alarm in the morning yeah. where if we work really, we sometimes we stay up really late till one or 2 a.m. And it's nice to be able to sleep until nine or 10 and just be rested because yeah. we're just going to be working again the next day. Right. <laughs> so we might as well be rested going into it, you know, and, and that has become part of how we view success for us right now at, at this point. Yeah. And so it is interesting how we can really take ownership of some of those definitions. Yeah. You know? I, and I, I think so. And I like that idea of taking ownership of it saying, well, I'm not, I'm not playing that game anymore. I'm not climbing that ladder. Mm -hmm. What, what is important to me? What, do, what, what are my priorities? What are my values? How does the way I'm living now align with those? And I feel like when we have tension, when we feel off kilter or out of balance, it's not because we're doing too much of one thing necessarily. It's because we're not living in alignment with, with those values and priorities. I love that. And speaking of that, has minimalism become a part of this journey for you as well? Yeah, I mean, it has. That was where I started. Like reading Leo's blog mm -hmm. was the first time that I had honestly realized there were people who were choosing to live a life with less stuff, but also less, like less commitment, less overwhelm, less, um, you know, financial strain, all of the, the other things that he writes about. Uh, that was the first time I had realized that that was a thing that you could do and people were choosing it. And not only were they choosing it, but they were saying that life was better because they had less. They had more because they had less. Uh, and so that was that was the first thing I did. I, I mean, Leah writes about a lot, mindfulness and health and relationships, and I couldn't deal with any of that at the time. My mental health was dreadful. but I So I could declutter, though. And that was where the whole process started for me. I started by decluttering our house over a period of a year. And um, then I really dove headfirst into minimalism. Um, and I appreciate it so much as a community of people who are trying to live in alignment with what's important because that's what it's about. You know, mm -hmm. I know it's become diluted and it's become this, like it's really interesting to me to see Minimalism as a lifestyle versus minimalism as an aesthetic and how marketers are like, well, now we can sell stuff to minimalists. Yeah, a new um, standard that's unreachable. Right, exactly. <laughs> a new set of Joneses. You know, I stopped trying to keep up with the Joneses down the street and found myself falling into the trap of thinking, well, what, does minim what should minimalism look like? Mm -hmm. So I love the movement of minimalism at its core, what it's really about. Mm -hmm. It's just frustrating for me to see people adopt minimalism and then try and like, grasp for the new standard yep um yeah if it's not scandinavian design right like get out of here exactly come on yeah exactly yeah. and i realized that when i was I, I decluttered and i became very good at decluttering but then i was also becoming very adept at recluttering <laughs> with newer <laughs> stuff or shinier uh -huh. things or more scandinavian design I'm like that's not that that didn't make me happy mm -hmm. it was a space that i created for other stuff like other other energies other ways of spending my time that made me happy yeah. i'm so glad you said that right. i just i'm so glad because it, it does seem like this can just become a new thing right it just becomes a new thing like well do i have succulents in a proper quantity <laughs> or like just <laughs> things like this you know <laughs> and and to us, I mean, you just, you know, have come into our home and like seen and we're, you know, we're, we're pretty low key. And right. the, the thing is we've 
in terms of the the scale of minimalism, uh, we are probably pretty in the middle. Um, but it's because we've done a lot of decluttering and found ways that that really work well for us. Yeah. And we're utilizing our home in ways that really work well for us. And none of the stuff we have is getting in the way of us doing anything that we set out to do. So yeah. to me, that feels like it's successful. But a lot of the time I'll get comments about things and it's like, it's not that minimal or you have more than 20 shirts or well, I have, don't have 20 shirts, but you know, you have well, like, yeah, right. <laughs> good thing. So I, this is a thing that I feel like minimalism shouldn't cost you money mm -hmm. that, that it, it can. Yeah. If you want to switch out for nicer things sure. that are longer lasting or you have that opportunity, but I always get caught up in this that, yeah, it's, um, uh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't cost you money to create a look. No, exactly. Just remove some excess, create some space, Yeah. use that space. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Was there anything that was particularly hard to let go of during that process? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I probably passed through the house three or four times and it was interesting to watch the evolution of stuff and my relationship to it. So I started out thinking that I was super sentimental and I had all these boxes of stuff, things from when the kids were babies, things from when I was running that business that I had closed down not long before, um, things from high school, you know, all this stuff. And first pass through of the house, that was like, I was never touching that. That is my, you know, there's my identity right there. Second pass through, I'm like, well, I'm not ready to get rid of it yet, but that doesn't mean quite as much as it used to. And by the time I go back to it the third or fourth time, it's evolved from important stuff to clutter. Uh, so I think the initial struggle was with sentimental items, which I think, again, is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just took time for me to realize that I wasn't missing anything that I had decluttered. That was a big realization. I couldn't remember most of it. Same. Let alone yeah. miss any of it. Uh, and that it was it felt safe. And not only did it feel safe to let go, but it also feels great to let go. And that was what motivated me creating that space and then what can I do with that space that I'm freeing up? Mm -hmm. uh, so I will say that sentimental stuff was tough initially, but it has gradually become less tough, mm -hmm. which is always my advice for people with sentimental clutter is give it time. Yeah. I mean, if, if that feels like a painful experience, then do something else. You know, it's not, I don't want decluttering to become a stick that people beat themselves up with either. It's a, it's a meant to make you feel lighter and freer, not, terrified yeah. you don't want to start with the hard stuff especially no. working with a partner on these things yeah. it's like the the thing that one person is like no never getting rid of that I'm like no, no no come on it's just 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 put it away exactly just put it away move on to something else it'll kill the energy you know exactly of what well, we've been through that and that, that was a lesson learned not a lesson read right, <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> <laughs> and i think sometimes you need to just you need to learn it and i made the decision pretty early on to never push Ben because he wasn't really on board. Hmm. He thought that it was part of my recovery from depression. And he's like, I'm all for it if it makes you happy. But he just thought it was a phase. Hmm. So I decided pretty early on that I wasn't going to touch his stuff for that exact reason. It would just breed resentment. You know, you can't drag someone into making these changes with no. you. You can enjoy the benefits and then hope that that's an example to them. Uh, but I don't think you can force someone to join you. I don't know about you guys, but I get asked a lot, how do I bring my partner along? So, yes. <laughs> you can't, you know, really, you can talk to them about it. But I've, I've found that the most helpful way of getting people to, to come along is to just do your thing and deal with your stuff and enjoy the benefits of having mm -hmm. less. And they'll see it and go, well, that seems kind of, you know, positive. That seems appealing. And then you'll come home one day and your husband's cleaning out his wardrobe, for example. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I say, uh, I do, we do get that because that is a very common thing as opposites, I think tend to attract yes. in relationships and that drives different personality types right. around these things. But, uh, yeah, I, I, around the same theme, I generally say, do what you can to be living proof. Yes. Just be living proof of what's possible with this thing. And, radiate that into your life and hopefully that makes some change because exactly. it is it is hard it is, it is hard and hard hard i also think people. the thing that people that i used to miss in that answer um was that we don't exist in a vacuum either you know our partners our kids our families they've all got different desires different needs different um things that they want to hold on to or not hold on to and relationships are compromise you know accept them for who they are and love them for who they are regardless 
And I think you take some of that bitterness or that tension out of the, the entire scenario and find that people are more inclined to then flow a little more, be a bit more fluid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I think the world would be boring if we we're all the same. Yes. <laughs> very monotonous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And probably not very productive. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Well, I actually have a question from uh, Caroline, who's a member of the Break the Twitch member community, um, that she wanted to ask you. Uh, so that is, how has slow traveling differed from slow living at home? Has it been easier or harder to Ooh. stick to being intentional in the different? It's a really good question. Uh, it's both is the answer, I think. There have been things about traveling that has made slow easier. Um, we've had to be really crystal clear on our priorities and our values because there's, we've removed all certainty and all like, kind of stability with the exception of our family unit. Everything is changing every few days. Mm -hmm. So I've had to, and I, I've kind of picked this up almost straight away that I needed to say no to pretty much everything. It's a season of, of yes to like touring and travel and it's a season to a season of yes to spending time with fam like my family um but beyond that i really had to lock down all of those other little things that were coming in and for for me i guess it's a little different because it is a i'm treating it as a work trip as well so ben and i decided from the outset that there's going to be so many wonderful experiences in cities that we visit that we're just not going to be able to do and we didn't beat ourselves up about that at all we decided what it was um, where we would focus our attention and stuck with it so in terms of being intentional it really we had to really be super intentional um, but then it's also the th the like the slow living rituals and the, the things that ground me in slowness couldn't necessarily um, stick around when we were moving so much so I used to get up in the morning and maybe I'd meditate um, journal and or do yoga like if I could do one of those three or two of those three that would be a great morning for me mm. that hasn't happened so much on the trip it's hard to do it in a hotel room with four people uh, but I've been getting really good at finding moments for slow in spite of the day being full or in spite of not having the tools that I would normally have uh, and it's been doing more of those uh, and less of the, the big stuff that has mm -hmm. made such a difference. Um, even just like deep breathing for a minute in the mornings or jotting a few things down in my journal, not actually having a full journal session or, you know, doing a lion's breath when we're outside or finding space to eat lunch outdoors in nature, like just those sorts of things. What is a lion's breath? Oh, it's like a, it's a yoga thing. So really deep breath into the belly and then you... Um, <laughs> You want to show you? Yeah, it's just your idea. Are you going to make a noise? And it's like you do it more enthusiastically than that. But you breathe, breathe it all out over the back of your throat, and mm. it's um, it helps exhale negative emotions, helps exhale stress and tension, and it helps with the jaw as mm. well. Um, and that has been amazing. All four of us have been doing lion's breaths all across the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I've done similar breathing exercises like uh, Win Hof talks right. about like the, the, the getting rid of all the, the carbon dioxide yeah. from your lungs, kind of purging. Yeah. Uh, it sounds similar to that, but the, I like the roar to it. Too. Right. That's and you nice do it like element. as aggressively as you want, you know, and if you're down on like hands and knees, you kind of lean forward and really get into it it's oh that's great, great. That's it's awesome. really cool so there's been you know like a lot of things there's pros and cons there's ways that are it's easier there's ways that it, it's harder um, but i think really prioritizing uh you know the things that are super important like our kids and giving them a sense of stability when there isn't a whole lot of it has been and knowing that from the outset has been the thing that kept us feeling like we were doing well even though we were dropping balls all around the place uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I admire your willingness and ability to do a tour like this. I always used to think that that was like easy, the right. dream. Like, right. what? You're just going from place to place and seeing all these amazing places. I used to also aspire to be the whole digital nomad thing mm -hmm. and travel and work from coffee shops, this whole romanticized idea of modern work yeah. maybe and 
Amy and I tried it in limited time. So we'd travel somewhere, try to work there. Mm -hmm. And all of my habits just went poof. Right. <laughs> it was really hard. And that was part of the reason why when we came back uh, in May here to Minneapolis, we redid this office. We created a home base mm -hmm. for work mm -hmm. because when I don't have a consistent routine, I really struggle to write, to do the creative things consistently. Yeah. And I look at all the people that are talking about the laptop lifestyle and all these things. And I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. I'm so glad that that works. But for me, I, I, I struggle with it. So I admire the fact that you're doing this book tour and you're making it work despite it being challenging. It's such a cool thing. Yeah. I do think it's interesting that whole um, like utopian idea of the laptop lifestyle. And I think we've been, again, sold this as what we should be aiming for. And if it works for people, and I know people that it does work for, mm -hmm. awesome. But it, it's not the only way to, yeah. to live with freedom. You know, I think for a lot of people, freedom or success or whatever, however you want to describe it, is having a home base. It's having rhythm. It's having surety mm -hmm. in certain areas. Uh, and that then allows you to be creative and to take risks elsewhere and you know i think it's it's much like the um it's like the the self-employment idea too which is sold as the way to have no worries and you know it's simpler and it's more freeing and it's more liberating and all these things like it can be but it's all it also comes with a huge amount of complexity that doesn't exist when you're in someone else's employee Neither is right or wrong, but I don't, I think it's interesting that we're all kind of taught that we should be, particularly in the online world, I think that's the goal that we're told we should all be working mm -hmm. towards. And if it works, great. But I also know a lot of people who have tried it for many years and then have gone and gotten a job. I'm like, it's just really nice that there's a pay that comes yeah. in every week. <laughs> there are people expecting you to be in a place right. and you're working with people. They're like, if you're an extrovert, especially being just in a default environment yes. where there's socialization going on and... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, again, like unpacking all of these things that we're told we should be working towards is it's part of the fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So around your new book, Slow, Simple Living for a Frantic World, I'm always curious, uh, having gone through a book writing process myself for a 17,000 word book that took me a year to write. So it was painful mm -hmm. and horrible and difficult, but I enjoyed it for the the growth and things that came from it right i'm always curious with other authors what was the book writing process like and were there some habits around that that helped uh yeah good question so i think it probably took me six months to write the first draft and my edits after that weren't there wasn't a huge amount of rewriting to do mm -hmm. i had to rewrite the final chapter <laughs> I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, but I made time to write every weekend. Um, I mean, I made time to write every day, but every weekend I would spend time in the library, the local public library. Mm -hmm. And there was something about the energy of that place that really got me thinking in a different way than when I'm at home tapping away on my laptop in the office. Mm -hmm. So I would get up in the mornings and I would write. Uh, I would just I would just write. Like I had to just put words on the paper at this point. I was committed to the fact that my first draft would suck and that I would hate every word that came out. And I did. <laughs> and it did. Yep. And I, I, I had to get comfortable with that because otherwise I would spend hours rewriting a paragraph until I thought it was just right. And then, of course, you're going to come back to it months later and rewrite it anyway. So it was letting go of having to edit myself as I went. Um, and then it was probably, oh, look, honestly, when I had my deadline looming, it was January and we had a holiday to Japan booked and I really just needed to have it done before then. Cause I couldn't go on a holiday with it hanging over my head. Um, uh, and I went to my parents' house for the last two weeks and I didn't speak to, they weren't home. Uh, I didn't speak to anyone. I didn't do anything other than get up and write. And I did it for six hours a day. And that was when I handed in my initial manuscript and also started to re- work some of the earlier chapters that mm -hmm. I'd worked on um but I got it done just before the trip which was great and I got an email on the last day of the trip saying it's all looking really good except for the last chapter <laughs> you're gonna have to rewrite it because by the time I had gotten to that point I think I was just so 
I was tired, you know, burnt out on the whole idea of slow living when I wasn't living slow in that particular moment. So um, it's painful, you know, and it's a personal book. Like it's quite a deeply personal book. So um, I didn't dredge anything up, but it was, I chose to be honest. Like I chose to tell the truth and that can be painful, especially when you're going through, going back through a period that was painful to start with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So there's a few tears, yeah, <laughs> tears shed in the writing. Um, yeah. But I was lucky also to work with a really great team. Um, I had a wonderful publisher, a really supportive editor, which made me feel less alone. That's good. I've, I've just understood the process to be so different for everyone. Um, and, but one common theme does seem to be that two week period before the deadline yeah. where things really it's amazing how creativity and things can creep in uh, and when when we're under deadlines like that. Yeah, and I, I at first I thought, oh, like I'm failing. I've had all this time and why am I still cramming at the end? But what I realized after is that all that time that I had been working on it, that was when I was working out the structure and, mm-hmm. you know, the, like the more practical stuff. And it was the creativity. It was the how do I weave this story that came in towards the end. And I think that, I don't know about everyone else, but... I certainly have some interesting and creative ideas when I'm under pressure. It's probably, it's problem solving. It's, I don't know. That has always been me though as well. When I was at school, I was always the <laughs> the last minute <laughs> finisher. I, I do think this just seems to be something that keeps coming up for me and for, for Amy and me working together. It's interesting because we keep having these moments of we really should have finish this by now, right? or we really should have been able to do this faster. Um, we're this far into this project and why is this not going? Why are we just feeling totally useless right now? And it just keeps coming back to this idea of like, actually, this is just the pace. This is how long it takes and we're not robots and we kind of just need to work through it. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes there needs to be a deadline for certain things to to happen so i can yeah yeah i think that idea of should we we really stress word. ourselves out don't we because of what we think should happen mm-hmm. um and i think when we go into any kind of situation with expectations of what it should look like we set ourselves up for suffering <laughs> truly <laughs> you know and, and I, it's yeah. same thing about slow living for example a lot of people say to me but how do i do slow living i've got kids and they're messy and they're busy and they're I'm like well let go of what you think it should look like first of all and what do you want it to look like don't worry about what the books and the podcasts and the magazines and the instagram hashtags show you what it should look like what should what do you want it to look like for you and i think letting go of that expectation and just being moving through the process is hard it's difficult but i think it's important you did mention something about the final chapter. Was there something specific about there? Or was it just that the... Yeah, yeah there was something very specific. They're like, you sound really negative in the final chapter. You sound... And I was, I was you know, I think... Mm-hmm. And actually, really interesting. I had gone into the book process thinking that it would look a particular way. Thinking that the writing would look a particular way in the process of, but also the book would look a particular way at the end. And I had expectations that it would be personal and practical and it it ended up being those things but the practicalities were not what I expected them to be and that's I got to the end of writing the book feeling like I'd failed that that Hmm. that quest of you know and I had this expectation of what it should include and that wasn't the book that that I wrote and so I think the final chapter was me rolling around in those regrets of you know this this expectation that I had come into the process with Um, and I really needed to figure out what I wanted the book to say in the end and I used that whole process that negativity that feedback to say well I expected this book to have more in it at the end and it doesn't but then I I used that to explain but I do that on purpose because I think for me to tell you that it should look like this is to set you up for suffering and you know finding a new set of joneses so i it was very painful i mean no one likes getting bad feedback right but it was so helpful and powerful not only for the book but for myself as well to really 
recognize what happens when we go into things with the expectations of what it will look like at the end. And I was really happy with the, the final chapter in the end, uh, but it took some writing. <laughs> oh, man. It was, that was a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. It's and I hard. felt like I'd kind of flayed myself open anyway. And every <laughs> little, like just a spelling error or a grammatical comment felt like I'm going to fail. You know, it felt like it was the worst thing in the world. And then to get that feedback, which was so well-intentioned and so true as well, felt like heavy. Mm. Um, but I was, again, fortunate to have a really supportive team and they let me have my, my moment of crisis and they're like, okay, but really all of this is good. This is just where we need to you to shift your, your mindset. And I did it anyway, I think, because I had shifted my mindset through the, the process. Having a holiday probably also helped. <laughs> yes. Strategic exactly. placement of That's right. vacation. Yeah. So for any aspiring authors that might be interested in writing a book like this or a writing a book of their own, are there any kind of tips or suggestions you might give other than I really liked what you said about kind of letting go of the expectation of what it's going to be? Right. Uh, yeah, I think... I mean, I'm certainly no expert because I feel like I muddled through the entire process. My one, oh, so here's a piece of advice. Read Stephen King's book on writing. It's my go-to. I love it. I, I love everything Stephen King writes, but that was the book that gave me permission to um, write in the way that I find myself comfortable in writing, which is to not outline too much, to not um, have a, I mean, he talks about fiction, obviously, but I also could apply it to writing nonfiction. Um, to just tell the truth. That's his one takeaway. I mean, he's got all of these practical pieces of advice and strategies, but he just says, tell the truth. And I found so much confidence in that. It's like someone gave me permission to just be honest. And that's the feedback that I love getting the most about the book, which is you, like you've just told my story. There's things that I've included in the book and people pick up on these little moments of truth, these little, these, these times where I didn't flinch and that, felt like I was writing something worthwhile, you know. Um, so I think start there, start by telling the truth. And I think obviously if you're writing nonfiction, then you need to have a point of view. You're trying to get people to think something or change something or um, reevaluate something. You've got an aim or a goal, but um, just tell the truth, you know. And I think I also was very determined not to come out of the book sounding like I had all the answers. Because nothing deflates me more than reading like gurus, to be honest. I just, everyone is human. Everyone struggles with things. Everyone is constantly evolving. So why not talk about it? Why not say, well, this works for me sometimes and other times it's a screaming failure and that's okay. Uh, yeah, so I think read on writing. <laughs> read Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott as well. It's very good. Hmm. And um and just start putting words on paper and, and see. I started the book process. I actually wrote, so the book opens with a letter to the Joneses. Uh, and I wrote that first, which I didn't expect would st be the opening of the book. But and, and from there, it kind of gave me permission to just be me, be weird, be quirky, be funny, be serious, be honest. Yeah. That's great advice. Thanks. Yeah, that's great advice. <laughs> I do with each year that passes in my life, I, I continue to see that vulnerability is the greatest strength. It, right. it is the ultimate form of strength. Um, simply being willing to be truthful in our own selves and our own stories and, and um, be vulnerable and give people permission to do the same. Yes. It's just like, especially in our current environment of, of Instagram and just everything the highlight reels and things like that it just seems like even if we feel imperfect we are especially it makes it especially hard when we already feel imperfect to put out something that makes us look less yeah and, yeah but it's such a strong thing to do and it's such a conversation we need to be having and and i just uh yeah so so thank you you're very welcome thank thank you but i think you're you're right and when you're struggling with self-confidence or belief or self-esteem, which I think most people are, and I think social media has got a part to play in that for mm -hmm. sure. It, it does feel terrifying, I think, to expose the, the scars or the cracks or 
Um, but something happens when we do. People connect differently. People connect, <laughs> full stop. And I think that's what's lacking in, for so many people is connection and feeling less alone. You know, when I was going through my depression, at least in the beginning, I didn't know anyone else who had gone through it. Or at least I thought I didn't know anyone else who had gone through it because no one spoke about it. And I decided really early on to be that person saying uncomfortable things, but just being honest. Not, I mean, I'm not kind of rolling around in negativity or anything like that, but just telling the truth. And what happened when I did that was that all of a sudden women that I knew started sharing their stories or one of um, my friend's husbands contacted me and he's like, we've been going through the same thing. And I would never have had any idea. So I think that, yeah, telling the truth. And in terms of a practical thing um, that may help writers as well is I journal and not I don't use anything from the journals in my writing um, because it's awful, but it has helped me to see the truth of who I am as well. Over many years, you start to strip away layers and actually ask questions of yourself and make realizations about who you are and why you do things. Uh, and I think that journaling has helped me in that more than anything else. So for people who want to write but don't know where to start, start journaling and then just have a daily writing habit of 100 words or you know whatever it is. But just start putting words on paper and it starts to become you know a rhythm to your day uh, and it's also a rhythm to your self-reflection and I think that is immensely helpful it's sometimes uncomfortable but <laughs> yes have you seen a difference between the physical act of writing versus typing oh yeah yes absolutely I um, my brain does not work as well if I am typing so I actually write most of my books out longhand yeah Wow. Yeah, I write very differently. Yeah. So um, we did a, uh, when was it? We Back in March or April, Ben and I did an experiment on the podcast where we did um, daily creativity. So creating just for the hell of it, not for anything other than for the joy of creating. And we did some research into writing by hand versus writing like typing. And apparently it engages typing, engages both sides of your brain which um, maybe it's because I'm left-handed, I'm not sure, but I, f I find my thoughts not as clear when I'm typing, whereas if I'm writing by hand, I find that I can get a lot more clarity um, and I'm more creative as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, definitely for me, and I know everyone's different, but for me, playing around with words um, and a pencil and a piece of paper is invaluable. Yeah, I've experimented a bit with the two as well, and, and one of the things that comes up for me is I, I learned to type very I had typing class right. in you know middle school or yeah. something like that <laughs> and so I learned to type touch type and everything very early and so I got pretty fast and I often find that my fingers can go faster than my brain right some, sometimes yeah where the process of appropriately slowing down and and doing the handwriting really let some more kind of processed or less processed i don't know if it's more processed or less but it's just something different and i've really taken to doing as much of the handwriting as possible but i cannot fathom writing a book <laughs> by hand That's to be amazing. fair i don't think um i mean there were there are passages that i would have written out by hand a number of times mm -hmm. just massaging them working them out and i think i'm less likely to censor myself when i'm writing by hand which has been really helpful for me. There are other passages that were pretty cut and dried and I knew what I wanted to say. I might've planned out on paper, but then the actual writing happened, um, you know, happened on a computer. But there were other parts of the book that I just needed to sit with. And I, I think there might be a slowness to it as well. And my brain works in a, in a different way because uh, I'm, I'm a fast typer as well. That's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Stephen King in his book says he starts all of his books longhand, um, but then his brain, his hand can't keep up with his brain once the characters really gain steam um, and he, he then swaps. But that kind of gave me, again, permission. I'm like, well, if I'm writing a book, I should be doing it on my computer. That's what authors do. They sit in coffee shops and they've got a pencil stuck in their hair and, you know, they, they write their book on their laptop. But I much prefer to write longhand, yeah. Mm. I'm definitely going to have to read that book. I made a note, so I'll, I'll put a link to that uh, it book is, and yours and others in the, in yeah. the description here. But It's um, probably good. one of my favorite books, nonfiction books. I read it mm, 
a lot, maybe 10 times. Hmm. Yeah. And every time I pull something different out of it as well. Definitely going to need to read that. Yeah. Um, so do you ever, uh, well, do you ever get impatient with the process of this stuff? And if so, what are some things that help with that? I, I think it's common to feel like we're fighting against this force right. of fast. Is there anything that just sort of habit wise or things like that, that help with that? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I do tend to be, I'm not an impatient person, but I do, I like action. Like I like movement. I like things moving along. Mm. Uh, and there's been definitely been times where I've had to remind myself that the reason it's called slow living is not only because you want to slow down, but because it takes time. And I think um, decluttering taught me that, as I mentioned before, there is there is an evolution that happens through these changes. And I think accepting and acknowledging that what I'm doing when I'm making these changes, no matter what they are, is essentially stripping away layers that I've built up on top of myself for many mm. years and doing that um takes time because if we jackhammer it all the way down to our true selves in one fell swoop, like we'd probably damage ourselves in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's like an excavation, you know, and sometimes you, you can use a hammer. Sometimes you have to use like a toothbrush and understanding that I think um, has, has helped a lot, but I know I keep talking about it, but journaling helps me there too, because I will. So the way I usually journal is like Julia Cameron's, um, morning pages mm. from the artist way. Yeah. That was my first iteration of journaling beyond my teen angst, dear diary years. And so I just, I put my pen to paper and I don't stop writing for three pages. And I'm fascinated by what comes out after about the first page and a half. First page and a half is usually, you know, this is what's on my mind. This is what I've got to do. This is why I'm feeling stressed, blah, blah, blah. But then it gets increasingly honest and closer to you know closer to the the core of things i think uh and that helps me to acknowledge and realize when i'm pushing things i do believe that there's times where uh let's say there's a big decision we need to make like when ben and i decided to sell our house in january we went back and forth on that decision for almost a year and it never felt there was never ease in that decision so we knew that it wasn't the right time to make it. We just had to trust that there would become a time where there was an effortlessness to the decision. And there was. So we spent a year toing and froing on, do we sell it? Do we not? Does this make sense? Does it not? Are we crazy? Maybe we are. Maybe we're not. And then one day it just felt ease, that we felt ease around the decision. And I think that learning that has been very important for us to acknowledge that sometimes there is a time to make a decision and sometimes if it's too there's too much resistance, maybe now's not the time to make the decision. And I apply that to everything now. And I mean it doesn't it very rarely fails us because I think um, when there's too much tension or too much resistance, we're often going to make a decision based on um, moving through that resistance or tension as quick as possible. That may not actually be the right choice. Yeah. So um, I think that was a very long-winded answer to say that finding ease takes time, but also acknowledging that there are times where we don't have it and maybe that's not where we should be pushing yet. Mm -hmm. So you are working with your partner, Ben. Yes. And how long have you been officially working together on the, the podcast? And uh, Well, he was on the podcast team <laughs> from day one, mm -hmm. so three and a half years. Uh, and at that point, he was still working his corporate job and doing the production of the podcast. And he helps co-host, so he will do the introductions with me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do most of the interviewing. So I tried to keep his time requirements as low as possible, um, given that, yeah, he was working 70 hours a week at the time. And then he, uh, he when was it? It was New Year's Day of 2016. He decided that that was the time that he was going to go out on his own um, and become a consultant. So he works in PR and communications and he made that leap. That was one of those decisions where it felt difficult, it felt impossible, felt tension. And then one day there was ease hmm. and it was the right call. So that was almost, that was two and a half years ago. 
that he made that decision. And we have worked together on different projects. I have helped him on some of his consultancy work. Um, and then he has stepped up on some of the writing work. We hosted a online retreat together last year. And um, there's, it's, it's actually great because it's, he's got his own thing. I've got my own thing. And there's other projects that we work on together. Uh, and that's been, yeah, sort of three and a half years in the making. He no longer does the production of the shows, though. I, we've got a producer, which nice. has really helped a lot, I think, for a lot of different ways. Are you are you both working at home together during the day? Is that for the most part? For the most part, yeah. I'm asking because personally, <laughs> we Amy and I started doing this in uh, October. Okay, working from home together. Uh, these two desks right here that people may be seeing on camera are our two desks that where we're working most of the time. And we've had to really evolve and we've enjoyed the process of, yeah. of evolving as a couple, as life partners and becoming business partners and creative partners. Uh, but we've also had to work to kind of create some boundaries and things. Yes. So I'm always curious, uh, what has that been like? And do you have any tips for people or ideas maybe that, that have been helpful? Boundaries mm -hmm. is the key word, I think, mm -hmm. because otherwise it can become all consuming. It's not, you're not leaving the, I mean, you can physically leave the office space, but you are at your place of work. And I think that our, like our living environment can really impact our ability to step away from work. So the fact that you can close a door is wonderful. We, before we sold our house in January, we had a space much like this. We worked literally side by side, uh, but we could close the door at the end of the day. Uh, and I also think that we probably from the very beginning of Ben being self-employed, uh, we decided that weekends were not for work and they weren't for talking work either. And I think part of that is because we've got kids and we wanted our time to be, you know, oriented to them because it, I mean, you, you would know, it's very easy to be passionate about a project and just talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. But that then takes a toll on your relationship in different ways, I think. Yep. And there'll be times that Ben will talk about work and I'm like, can we just not for now? Cause we're not actually at work. So can we, and there's times where I will be really hyped on an idea and just be, that's how I work things out. I talk to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah. Can we not please? <laughs> so I think being aware of that and each other's and, learning to pick up on cues of each other's energy and their headspace and when they're really engaged and when they're really, really not has been important too. Uh, and then honoring that for the other person, even though I might really want to talk about it, I'll just go and write about it instead because he's just not, not ready to hear it right now. Sure. So I think that that's important. Um, and also tech taking, um, like creating boundaries around our use of tech, because I think, Otherwise, that then becomes this thing that is, again, all-consuming. And for me, it's, um, it's kind of, I think it's probably easier because I view social media as work. I don't view it as playtime. And that's just the way it has evolved over the last few years. So it's easier for me to just disregard it on the weekend. Um, but when it's something that like Ben enjoys it, for example, he enjoys you know Instagram. So he'll be on Instagram for 10 minutes, but then muscle memory takes over and before you know it it's Saturday afternoon but you're looking at your emails so I think creating a 24-hour period on the weekend um, midday Saturday to midday Sunday without any social media without any screens with the exception of like a movie uh, has helped as well because as you I think you and I spoke about it two years ago creating that that time where you're just not doing a thing highlights how often you go to do that thing it highlights how often you pick up the phone to check something else, but all of a sudden you're on Facebook, you know. So creating that has, has helped a, a lot as well. Nothing will make you realize just how dependent you are on something than completely taking it away yep. at random and realizing you keep reaching for something or you feel that urge. It's the twitch. Exactly. It's and it, um, yeah, I think it, it's really important to install those kinds of barriers to remind ourselves consistently how often we reach for them when we're uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, when we're procrastinating, when we're about to do something unpleasant and we don't want to, how often do we reach for our phone and get on Twitter, you know? And I think, yeah, that's just, it's brilliant to be able to, to create a buffer between desire and action because so often we're just doing things mindlessly. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's good. We've definitely found that the boundaries, trying to set things in the calendar. I saw this picture once that that said, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And then it was all scribbled out and it said, you'll work all the time and be completely consumed by it. Right. <laughs> and that has been more the case for us where I'm pretty sure we work more now than we did when we were both employed at companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was at a nonprofit. Amy was at a um, agency, and and uh, this is the life we're building for ourselves, and and we do love it, but it absolutely can and does consume every moment of our lives. Yeah, and we're trying to create some of those boundaries, and we're getting there, but it's been a process. And I think I think that that's the season though as well of like starting something new. You're going mm -hmm. to be tilting really heavily into work, and that means you tilt away from all the other things. But it's it's then recognizing that that has been an act of, of tilting. So what can we then tilt into now that will over time give us balance? Mm -hmm. I'm like I'm not a fan of the idea of work life balance on the daily. I think it's very stressful for people mm -hmm. to try and achieve this weird notion of work life balance every day but do you feel like you've got balance over six months you know do you feel like the last year you've applied enough time and energy to the things that are important but i mean we're not going to be able to do that every day so right. yeah i think uh but i love that idea of creating space to do other things I mean, and also enjoy the benefit that working for yourself um provides which might be going going to see a movie like at lunchtime on a friday right or taking a long weekend, working really hard at the beginning of the week and taking two days off. Like enjoying those benefits also makes it feel worthwhile. We literally have to remind ourselves sometimes it's like 2 p.m. and it's beautiful out here. There's about six months of beautiful, nice weather yeah. per year <laughs> in Minneapolis. And it's wonderful out and we're sitting here and it's like, just go outside, dummy. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. go take a walk, go do something. And, and then come back and it'll be this will all be here all night so exactly yeah it's it's amazing how simple it can, or easy it can be to just lose that stuff yeah sometimes. we're really good at um not doing the things that we know are good for us even though we know that they're good for us yeah. back in march ben and i did a another experiment so every two months on the podcast we do an experiment and um we did one where we committed to spending 60 minutes in nature every day and that was really wonderful, first of all, because it got us out into nature every day, regardless of the weather. I mean, we were in BC at the time, so it was oh. winter. <laughs> it was snowing and we had an ice storm and we still managed to get outside for an hour every day. Uh, and that was one of the things that Ben recognized that he got this, he got the benefit of being in nature physically, but also the headspace that came with it, the creative thought and the critical thinking that happens when we're away from a problem. And he would get back and he would be more productive. He would be more engaged with his work because he'd taken himself away from it. I think that was really valuable for him to understand that you can call it self-care if you want. You can call it whatever you want. But it is so important to completely disengage from our work at various times throughout the day and throughout the week. Uh, and we're actually better for it. So that I think has also been really important for, for his mental health. He's not a journaler. He's not a meditator. He can't, he's tried them and it just doesn't work for him, but getting outside, giving himself the opportunity to think, let, like, let, let those problems kind of percolate at the back of his mind where he's doing something completely removed mm -hmm. has been really great for him too. Yeah. To see that that's not unproductive time. That's really important time. That shift is just so critical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of productivity, and I've, I've been really trying to embrace and share these ideas of around productivity in fun, yes, productivity in rest, productivity in work, yeah, that we can be productive while doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And letting go of the guilt while doing it as well, right. because otherwise, if you're kind of tied up in knots while you're resting, yes. are you really resting? Uh, <laughs> it's like we torture ourselves. Uh thinking, oh, I really should. <laughs> I was just joking with Amy. There are two modes. There's doing things and then thinking about the things we should probably <laughs> be doing right now. Yeah. And overcoming that is just such a, it's such a challenge. Again, it goes back to the pace of modern expectation of the yeah. things that, that we are up against. We, we have to really push to come back the other way. Yeah. Do you feel like that's because, um, 
we lose sight of what we've like how far we've come i mean do you think that going back and looking at where you were six months ago and seeing where you are now would be a positive thing because then you could say Mm -hmm. it feels like it's never ending but look we have changed and we are making great strides do you think that would help absolutely Mm. thinking back yes in fact we've been there we've we've done that it's easy for six months to go by or or here it's very very obvious uh, when time passes you have four seasons the all the leaves die the snow falls and then it's warm again and then it's summer and and humid so there's a very clear passage of time here and so it is easy to feel like what have i done in the last six months but when you start to think about it um oh, we launched a podcast, we started a member community, we did these things and we've been working on our, our health, our fitness, we've been keeping up a, a fitness habit for the last nine months or so and really trying to focus on staying healthy right. and keeping balanced. And when you look at all of that, it's like, okay, we've been doing things, yeah. we're, we're working hard and we're doing things, but at the same time, we constantly, yeah, you're right. So looking back is helpful, really taking some time to go, okay, what was successful about the last six months? What are the things we did? What were we prioritizing? And how did that reflect our current situation? Exactly. Yeah. And I also think it helps to create um, contentment in where you are because you, and it sort of let go of that need to always be pushing because you've been, you've been moving, you have made these huge leaps, you've added new things to your life and you've stuck with them. And um, I think that that for me, that that checking in also helps me to find contentment where I am. Um, And also, I guess, acknowledge that I will move forward. It just may not happen in the order that I want it to or at the pace in which I want it to. And that in itself is really important to acknowledge. I think it's not going to be at the pace that I want it to necessarily, um, for lots of reasons. But and maybe it's the pace it needs, needs to, to be. be. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is a question that I, I tend to ask everyone and it's very broad intentionally. What does creativity mean to you? I think anything can be a creative act. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's not even making necessarily, I mean, I've, of course it can be, but um, I think that we can think about a problem creatively. I think that we can approach our day creatively. I think we can parent creatively. I think it's thinking outside the box, you know, the capital B box that we look at most of the time. And I think acknowledging that there's a box there and then thinking outside of it is is creativity. I mean, for me, as I've always been a maker or a doer or a writer, So for me, I always think about writing as creativity or telling a story as creativity. Um, I used to be a cross stitcher. (laughs) I used to make jewelry. I used to do all these things. So for me, that was creativity. But I look at, um, you know, the way Ben solves it. He would say that he's not a creative person, but the way he solves a problem is creative. Um, I look at my dad, who's a super practical guy, and he always has this way of thinking about thinking outside the box and coming up with solutions to problems. My mum's the same, but with emotional stuff. Um, I think all of that can be creativity, but what I do think is that creativity is essential. (laughs) And I think that everyone is creative. We, um, yeah, I think everyone is, is, is creative, whether they think that they are or not. Yeah. It is all things. I have that friends are like, I'm not, I'm just, you're so creative. I'm like, I'm not that creative compared to like, you're so, you're an engineer. Right. You're coming, like you're creative. It's, yeah. it's not, you know, we don't have to strip naked and paint our, ourselves exactly. and like to be creative. You know, yeah. it's not, uh, it's not that it, it can be so many more things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have a sister who's a teacher um, and she, the way she approaches different children's needs mm-hmm. is creative. I mean, it's thinking about ways to solve a problem or to, um, you know, bring a group of people together. I mean, you can you can be a creative conversationalist. The way that you introduce people can be creative. The way that you tie people together is, is creative. I mean, look at Joel. The way he connects people is an act of creation because you're creating relationships. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty think. sure he may be the, the reason we're sitting here right oh, now. Exactly. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah, that, that's just a... Uh, point to your your uh, your point yeah. yeah 
when you were writing this book, who were you writing the book for? It's a very good question because I thought I knew the answer when I was writing. <laughs> I thought that I was writing for a woman who was me five years ago. So someone who may or may not have kids, but really was struggling under the pressure to be everything to everyone. Um, and the reason I thought it would be a woman is because that was my story, you know, uh, and I'd, sp I'd spoken to so many women whose mental health had suffered over the years because of these expectations, because of this sense of being trapped, doing all the things, trying to find happiness, buying stuff, having to work harder to pay for the stuff, to realize that none of it actually made us happy in the first place. So I thought that that's who I was writing it for. Uh, and that absolutely is part of the audience who's resonated with it. But the thing that's fascinated me is that it has appealed to such a, a much broader audience than I expected. I mean, university students will tell me how much they took from it, which is awesome because when I was at uni, I was an idiot. Like I had no... <laughs> you too, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. like, n no sense of what it was to be intentional or to think forward. I was just reaction like I was a I was a reaction wrapped up in clothes basically um and it makes me really happy to know that it's like 18 year old kids reading engaging with this idea of doing life counterculturally um, but also a lot of retirees men and women have resonated with it and I think that that's a really interesting point in people's lives retirement because they go from busy 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 to the potential of not having a lot on and that feels terrifying but also they've realized that there's so many things that they haven't been doing in their lives like uh, you know connecting like maintaining strong relationships like decluttering and decluttering for retirees seems to be huge because they're all about the, the downsides and um, realizing that they've got 40 or 50 years worth of stuff to to sort through is difficult um so I really wrote it for anyone who feels like the pace of the world is too much. Um, and I know that's a, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yep. Hopefully they will Big market it. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are you excited about right now? I'm excited about uh, quiet. <laughs> I'm excited. So the book tour ends in a, a tomorrow is the last event. And I have a few days of media in Canada. And then I'm really excited about taking a holiday with my family. We're going completely offline, like removing email and social media from our phones and not connecting at all except with each other. So I'm really excited about that. But I'm also, it's interesting what happens when you remove all stability from your life, the things that you crave. I, I'm excited to go back. So we're going back to Canada in November for a couple of months to stay in an Airbnb and cook, you know, and really create those, oh, yeah. those home-based rhythms that I didn't think too much of um, previous to the trip. Like I did it and I was happy to do it, but it wasn't something that I ever craved and really just enjoy them, you know, really just soak in the mundanity of it all, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, being in one place long enough to go to the library and to create a little life rhythm. I'm very much looking forward to that too. Amen. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's great. Um, so where can people find you online? I'll put links to everything in the description of the video and in the podcast page. But for those listening. Yeah. Slowyourhome.com is the best place to find everything. It links to social media. It links to the podcast and the eight years of blog archives as well are all there. Yes, and I would highly recommend the, the podcast, uh, everything, checking it out. It's great stuff. So definitely, uh, definitely do that. And now it is time for question from the question bowl, uh, which I can grab or you can grab, sure. but it's right over there with those blue uh, cards there. And these are questions that have been left largely by previous guests that's cool so and then i'll have you fill out your own question as well Absolutely. when we wrap up okay uh it is oh there's anila who's a previous guest yeah. great um so anila said what is what's your favorite childhood memory oh. i had a great childhood so <laughs> i'm fortunate that there's a lot of options favorite childhood memory we used to go camping a lot as kids and we would stay somewhere for like three or four weeks um 
and I had some of my the most fun times camping um, with my family. I remember putting on shows. There was one particular time where we put on like a big performance. I'm one of four girls. Um, we put on a big show and that show involved pulling down someone else's tent and moving them around inside it. Uh, and that's, I don't know, just ha- having that complete freedom and that time spent outside and um, with family, it was just simple and beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to do that with my cousins. We'd put on magic shows right. at all the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd do these ridiculous Probably not real magic tricks, but all the, you know, the adults would all clap nicely for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, my kids are now at that age. They put on a lot of show, a lot of shows. Yeah. My son put on a, um, a pirate show at one of the bookstores that I was doing mm. an event at. He got more people to his than I did to mine. Wow. So, yeah, okay. That was, that was it's impressive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Embarrassing is the word that I would use. <laughs> impressive for him. I that's suppose, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, uh, Brooke, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to, to have you here in, in our home and share this podcast. It's yeah. been amazing. Thank you. I love this conversation style. It's been brilliant. So thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. So as usual, I'm really looking forward to sharing one of the things I took away from this interview. But first, I have to ask if you haven't left a review on Apple Podcasts, I would greatly appreciate it. It would mean the world to me if you took a moment to go on and leave a review if you are enjoying this podcast. It is the lifeblood of podcasts like this one, and it really helps to get the word out and let other people know that this is something they might enjoy. So if you have taken a moment to do that, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. One of the things that came up in my conversation with Brooke was the idea of work-life balance. Now, I've always personally believed that this should just be called life balance because work is just a part of life. Life makes up the whole pie chart. The whole thing is life and work is a part of it that needs to fit in along with the other things in it. But the idea of work-life balance is a really fascinating one, especially from my perspective running a podcast and running a YouTube channel and doing the types of things that require very intense seasons of work. I really loved what Brooke was saying about how work-life balance is not on a day-to-day scale. There are often going to be seasons when the family has more obligations or when work has more obligations where you just can't perfectly section out each day to have four hours of family time perfectly and eight hours of work time and everything just finds its perfect little balance. It just doesn't work that way. What you can do hopefully is find a balance in the coming months, find a balance now if you're just getting through one of these massive periods of work to embrace slow and not find it necessary to keep going at that pace all the time because eventually something has to give. So that's something that I think is really important and something we can all embrace in one way or another. Looking at it on the small scale of life balance day to day, week to week, and then on the big scale of life balance month to month and year to year. Finding the ebbs and flows of what is required of us in our day to day lives. Thank you so much for listening to the Break the Twitch podcast. I'm really glad to have had you here to share this conversation with you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll see you next week.